Hello fellow problem solvers. So today we're going to be doing a problem from the 2009 IMO problem number one. I suggest you try this problem out for a minimum of half an hour, ideally an hour to an hour and a half, but not more than two and a half hours. If on the other hand you would like to go along with us, I suggest you take a preliminary look of half an hour, put your first ideas out on paper, try a bunch of stuff and then come along with us. Now without further ado, let's begin. So, in summary, we have k integers, a1, a2 to a k. All of them are distinct, and they are some numbers from 1 to n. And furthermore, we have this condition that n divides a i times a i plus 1 minus 1 for all i 1, 2 to k minus 1. And what we need to prove is that n does not divide a k times a1 minus 1. Now, before I go into the proof, I would like to take a big picture view and say, what does it mean for n to divide ai times ai plus 1 minus 1 for i 1 to k minus 1? And what does it mean for the, op for the problem statements to not hold for n to divide a k times a 1 minus 1? Now, before I show this to you, I suggest you take two minutes to sort of think about what is the difference between this problem condition holding and this thing being true as well. And what would it mean for this thing to be false for n to actually divide a k times a one minus one. And the idea here is quite simply that if this condition holds true, then you can think of it as you put these numbers on a line. This does not mean that a one is less than a two, less than a three, just like put them on a line. This can be like 10, five, 11, some combination of some numbers that satisfy this condition, all the way till a k. And what the problem condition sort of states is n divides each number times neighbor, the neighbor to its right minus 1. So it divides a3 times neighbor to its right minus 1 for each number which has a neighbor to the right. And so what we find for a1 does not necessarily need to hold for a4. Now, to prove this problem, to prove that n doesn't divide a k times a1 minus 1, the only thing I can really think about doing is to assume the contrary, prove by contradiction. Say, assume the contrary, assume n does divide this, and then let's get to a contradiction. But the big picture view is that if n divides a k times a1 minus 1, then we no longer look at these numbers as being on a line in a row, but rather you can think of them as being on a circle, a1, a2, a3, and all the way till a k. And the same thing holds true. n divides each number on the circle times its neighbor to the right minus 1. So this is an important distinction between the two. And what does it mean for these numbers to be on the circle there? The condition is cyclic, but more so it tells you something along the lines of we find for a, if we find something general for a1, we should be able to apply a similar general argument for a2. And now with this big picture sort of view in mind, I suggest you take 20 minutes and figure like, what's the first thing you would do here to like, when you assume the contrary, and divides every single number here times its right neighbor minus one, what would be the things that you would try to do? And the reason I invite you to pause here for 20, actually even 30 minutes, is because there are many possible approaches and I will try to cover one or two of them. So here's one way of thinking about the problem, a way I've thought about it when I first attempted to solve the problem. So this approach goes back to that idea, if you don't know what to do with the problem, then try to play around with it. And what I try to do here is say, what if n is prime, if n is a prime number, and is equal to some prime p, then from the condition p divides, say, a1 times a2 minus 1, we know one of the two things is true, either p divides a1 or p divides a2 minus 1. Now, if one of the numbers say, because all of these are in a circle, if one of them isn't divisible by p, say p doesn't divide a1, that means that a2 is, congr is congruent to 1 modulo p. But what does this tell us for the next condition that p divides a2 times 
a3 minus 1. Well, it tells us that because p doesn't divide a2, p divides a3 minus 1, which means a3 is congruent to 1 modulo p. And in the same way we can get that every single one of these numbers, because they are on a circle, is congruent to 1 modulo p. Given they are in members of the set 1, 2, p, that means all of these numbers are equal to 1, and that's a contradiction because we assume these numbers are distinct. Now, what if n, instead of equal to a prime p, what if n is equal to some prime power, p to the power of alpha? And then p to the power of alpha divides, say, a1 times a2 minus 1. I invite you to take 5 to 10 minutes and see what does this imply. Think about what can you do with this case. And the idea is, say, p to the power of alpha, say p doesn't divide p itself doesn't divide one of these numbers and say it's a1 without loss of generality again because this is a all these numbers are in a circle it, it doesn't matter if it's a1 or a k or a5 if we assume the contrary and if p doesn't divide say a1 that means that p to the alpha divides a2 minus 1 which means that a2 is congruent to 1 modulo p to the alpha and then this, this means that p does not divide a2. And from the next condition, we have p to the alpha divides a2 times a3 minus 1. And now again, p to the alpha does not divide this, so p to the alpha divides this. And we infer a3 is congruent to 1 modulo p to the alpha. Because both a2 and a3 are in the set 1, 2, p to the alpha. Because both are congruent to 1 modulo p to the alpha. That means both they're equal to 1, and because they're both equal to 1, that contradicts their distinctiveness. Now, I invite you to try to generalize this for not just prime powers, but all composite integers. Take 5 to 10 minutes and see if you can finish it up. Here's the basic idea. And what I want to stress before I show the basic idea is that the big leap of insight here is saying I have my prime p to the power of something, dividing ai times ai plus 1 minus 1. And I'm saying, what if one of these numbers isn't divisible by p at all? What does that give me for the other numbers? And also what happens, we also need to figure out what happens if every single one of these numbers is divisible by p. So if this number is divisible by p, but not p to the alpha, that means this number must also be divisible by p, which makes ai plus 1, not divisible by p, and then we can infer, oh, there was one number that's not divisible by p at all, and then we can get to our inference. So the argument sort of is, if at least one of the numbers isn't divisible by p, then all of them aren't divisible by p, and like instead they all need to be 1, and if, on the other hand, all of them are divisible by p, then all of them must be divisible by p to the power of alpha, because if p divides both a1 and ai plus 1, then p, to the, then p does not divide ai plus 1 minus 1, so it only divides this, which means ai must be congruent 0 modulo p to the alpha, must be divisible by p to the alpha. Given it's between 1 and p to the alpha, that means it's p to the alpha, and this holds for all of them, a contradiction to their distinctiveness. Now, in general, what we would say, let and be equal to p1 to the alpha 1 times p2 to the alpha 2 pt to the alpha t. And now take some prime number, of, take one of these, say take, take, let's look at pi to the alpha i. So the question is now, does, is every one of numbers a1 till ak divisible by pi to the alpha i? Well, assume it's not, let's say, first case, one of the numbers, say a1, is not divisible by pi to the alpha i. In this case, we have that pi, the alpha i, divides a1 times a2 minus 1. And now we know that, say, pi divides a2 minus 1 which implies pi does not divide a2, which then implies that from, from pi to the alpha i, dividing a2 times a3 minus 1, 
This implies pi to the alpha i divides a3 minus 1. And now this implies that a3 is congruent to 1 modulo pi alpha i. And it, then we can find that a4 is congruent to 1 and so on. In the second case, if, say, all of the numbers are divisible by pi to the alpha i, then we would have all numbers divisible by pi to the alpha i. But the main thing is that for every pi, we have that a1, a2, ak are all 0 or 1 modulo pi to the alpha i, and they are all the same. a1 is congruent to a2, is congruent to ak, is congruent to 0 or 1, modulo pi to the power of alpha i for each i equals 1 to 2 t. Now, bring it back to the original n. What does that mean? If every one of these numbers is congruent to, the, to themselves, to each other, mod each of these prime powers of primes that are dividing n, that means that all of these numbers are congruent to the same thing, modulo p1 to the alpha 1 times p2 to the alpha 2 times p t to the alpha t, which is n. And the reason they're all congruent to the same thing is we can say that by the Chinese remainder theorem, by the CRT. We know that a1 is congruent to a2, congruent to a k mod n. And this would be fine and dandy, a way to finish it. But now I, and this is just like using the Chinese remainder theorem. But now I would like to come back to the beginning and show a different approach. So let's do that now. Okay, so we're back in the beginning. And what I wanted to focus on is, say, another way we could have played around with the problem is when we have divisibilities like this, like many divisibility conditions, the same n dividing the same things, that a natural sort of question is, what can we do with these things? Can we add them up, multiply and add and subtract? What can we do? And one of the things like I was doing when I was trying to solve the problem now in preparation for this video, I was looking, okay, n divides this. If I multiply both sides by a1, I have this, which is also true. Now, if I add these together, I get, and this was just really me, just messing around with the problem. And I added them up and I got n divides. These two cancel out, which is why multiplied by a1, we get this, n divides a1, a2, a3, minus a1. I was like, okay, can I do anything more with this? So I was looking at, okay, n also divides, let me look at a3 times a4 minus one. This is a3, a4 minus a3. I'm like, okay. Well here, let's, I'm actually, let me invite you. Take a pause for five to 10 minutes and see what would you do here? The goal is just play with it. See what you find. I mean. Ideally, try to finish the problem. I mean, take 20 if you want to try to finish the problem. And now that you've hopefully paused, I mean, here's the sort of thing that I got. I said, okay, let me then cancel. I did cancellations like this. Let me cancel this, these things out. And the way I do that is I multiply both sides by a two a one. And I can do this because if n divides x, then x divides x times y, then n divides x times y. So I'm good with that. And now I have n divides a1, a2, a3, a4 minus a3, a2, a1. I add these two together and I get n divides a1, a2, a3, a4 minus a1. Now the question is how, how much can I continue doing this? Well, I can do this with, if I do this with say, what's the next one? So when I did it with a3 times a4, I got all the way till a4. So if I do it still, n divides, if I keep doing this sort of inductively, if I do it and I say n divides a, what was it, a k minus one times a k minus one. So what do I get here? Uh, I multiply via induction. I will assume that I already have that n divides a one, a two till a k minus one minus a one. And now what I'll do here is I'll multiply both sides by a1 times a2 times a, not both sides, I'll multiply everything by 
a1 times a2 times all the way till ak minus 2. And we'll get that this divides a1 times a2 times ak minus 1, ak minus 1. Add these two things up. These two cancel out. And we get n divides a1, a2 until ak minus a1. Now, what can I do with this? The answer is actually, I am basically done. I can look at, say, n divides ak times a1 minus 1. And look, oh, if I multiply everything by a1 times a2 times ak minus 1, then what I'll get is a1 squared times a2 times... I'll get everything I got here, really, minus a1 again. I'll just get something extra. But really, I don't need to look at this. What I need to see is that this implies that a1 is congruent to a1 times ak modulo n. And now here's the thing about all of these lying on a circle. Take a, say, minutes to two minutes and figure out, like, what does this mean for the other AIs if I figure that A1 is congruent to this thing, modulo n? Well, it means that because all of these are on a circle. I just started from, so what do we just do? We started from n divides A1 times A2 minus 1. If we started from, if we just shifted by 1, if we started from A2 times A3 minus 1, and then multiplied this by A2, add them together and then continue this process all the way till whatever we needed to get, we would get that a2 is also congruent to a1 times a2 times ak modulo n. And we would get a1, a2 are congruent modulo n, given both of them are between 1 and n. This means that a1 and a2 are equal which is a contradiction. Now this is a different sort of flavor of the problem. This also solves that we just assume the contrary and then solve the problem. And now finally, I will write this up. I invite you to take really 10 to 20 minutes and figure out how you would write this up. And I'll write this down using a little bit of sleight of hand perhaps, but I invite you to take 10 to 20 minutes and see how you would write this down. And now we go to the write up. So first, we say, assume the contrary, n divides ak times a1 minus 1. Now, we have that from n divides ai times ai plus 1 minus ai. We have that ai is congruent to ai times ai plus 1 modulo n. To expand upon this, we mean a1 is congruent to a1 a2 mod n, but a2 is congruent to a2 a3 mod n. And given this, we have that a1 times a2, which means a1 times a2, is congruent to a1 times a2 times a3 mod n. And now we say we have basically a1 is congruent to a2 a1 mod n, is congruent to a3, A2, A1 mod n is congruent to all the way till AK, AK minus 1 till A2, A1 modulo n. And in a similar way, we have A2 is congruent to A2, A3 is congruent to A2, A3, A4 is congruent to A2, A3, A4 till AK minus 1 a k, a1 mod n, and now this implies that a1 is congruent to a2 mod n, which implies that because a1, a2 are less than or equal to n, greater than or equal to 1, that a1 is equal to a2, which is a contradiction. And given that our original assumption, assuming to the contrary, gave us a contradiction, this means that the assumption was false, namely that this means that n does not divide ak times a1 minus 1, which is what we needed to prove. QED! And as always, thanks for problem solving.